Welcome to the sit down. Joining me is Superintendent of Lubbock ISD Schools, Dr. Kathy Rollo. Dr. Rollo, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, school year about to swing into full full gear. We um, start a week from tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> are you uh, are you excited about what lies ahead this year? I really am excited. I think we're going to have a fantastic year. We have a lot of exciting things in place. So. Absolutely. You know your your background runs deep, not only in the district <laughs> but in Lubbock, Texas Tech as a whole. Could you tell us a little bit about that background and sort of what led you to superintendent well, uh, here for the for the district? Sure, sure. I'm a born and raised Lubbockite. Um, my entire life in Lubbock, so it's definitely home. My parents are here, um, my husband's parents are here. I met my husband two doors down, so I married the boy almost next door. <laughs> but um, yes, so I'm a product of Lubbock ISD. I went to Wester Evans and Coronado High School, um, stayed at Texas Tech and, and have three degrees from Texas Tech. So we bleed red and black in our family. My husband um, is an architect here in town and, and is also a tech grad. and, and Two of our three sons are tech grads, so. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> what, what were some of your experiences that led you to want to work higher up, I mean, all the way up to superintendent? Obviously, that's a, an interesting path to yeah. take. Did you always know that's kind of what you wanted to, to do? How did you get there? Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a teacher in Lubbock ISD, elementary teacher. I taught pretty much all grade levels in elementary school. Um, and then I became an assistant principal and a principal. I was the principal at Murphy Elementary for 10 years. And then when, in 2009, Dr. Karen Garza came to Lubbock as superintendent and she recruited me to start a professional development department for the district. We didn't have that in place. And so um, for four years, I really um, had a blast working around adult learning and helping our adults build their capacity to teach. And, and so that was a lot of fun. And then when Dr. Robertson was named superintendent, he wanted to restructure and um, asked me to be associate superintendent for elementary. And I did that through last June. And then I actually took a little stint and came and worked for tech. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I taught principal interns for the College of Education. And, um, and then here I am. So I really wasn't planning on this. It's something that just kind of happened and, and sure. I'm loving it. It's yeah. been great. And hopefully I can help take our district to the next level. Absolutely. And, and, and you have three pillars. You've talked about three pillars uh, of your administration, what you hope to do as superintendent, value data, yes. love people and develop leaders. Could you go into that and tell us a little bit more about what that entails? Absolutely. We're trying to frame all of our work around those three pillars. So valuing data is really looking at our data very closely and seeing number one, what works. Um, number two, if it's not working, what can we take off of plates so that people aren't overwhelmed? And also, we need to find out what is working in our district so we can investigate more and find out what they're doing that's working because we have perfect examples within our own district. And then valuing data is also looking at qualitative data. So one of the things I've been doing since I started February 1st is what I call lunch and listens. And I've been going to every campus and just sitting in the teacher's lounge while the teachers have their lunch periods and just asking three questions. What's working? What could we do better? And, um, and really, those are basically the two questions. But, and then just getting their input. What ideas do you sure. have? And so that's been great because we've actually made some adjustments to things we're doing based on that data. Um, loving people is, is kind of based on what I said, but listening to people, sure. what, wor what works and what doesn't, taking things off of their plates if it's not. And our teachers are the most important people in our district because they directly work with students every day. So just making sure our teachers have the tools they need and listening to their needs is, is really important. And then developing leaders, just investing in in the adults in our district as leaders and then also kids as leaders. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 you see you've seen it from every perspective now, especially now a superintendent uh, started February, uh, so you've had some time in that role, but then also as a teacher, as a student, <laughs> yes. as a parent. Yes. What are some of the things you've seen, what are some of the philosophies you've sort of gleaned over that career that sort of guide your, that led you to those three pillars? What's sort of the background of, of where that comes from? What have you seen in all of those roles that helped you develop those and, and what you, you, you set forth as your vision as the superintendent? Really, I've, I've used this saying a lot, and I borrowed it from Dr. Bill Daggett, who's um, an education guru, but culture trumps strategy. So if we don't have a healthy culture where people feel 
that what they're doing is making a difference and if we're not celebrating and acknowledging successes, we can put every strategy in place we want to to improve, but it's not gonna work. It's not gonna give us sustained success. So um, I really believe, and I believe this is why the board of trustees wanted me to be superintendent is because we've got to build that culture, make sure that we're focused on goals that make sense, make sure we're cohesive, make sure that we're adapting to change and taking care of people as we do make changes. Absolutely, and, and um, I come from a background of teacher. My mom is an English teacher uh -huh. and a theater teacher. My sister-in-law is a teacher. My brother's a teacher. I have two aunts that are teachers. <laughs> yes, and it goes, it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> and, and it's a difficult time. It's a tough time to be a teacher. Um, standardized testing has really kind of taken over and kind of moved to the forefront. Just as a parent, I, I see my kids in their learning environment, and I, and maybe I'm a little nostalgic, <laughs> but I think about sort of how I learned, and it's a very different uh, type of learning. How do you still create a holistic environment for students to learn in, um, in the age of standardized testing? That is a very good question. Um, when I was a principal for 10 years at Murphy Elementary, um, it was uh, one of our highest performing schools, but one of the things that I would never let my teachers do is even mention the test until right before, you know, get a good night's sleep, sure. eat a good breakfast, <laughs> those things. But I, I truly believe that if you are teaching at high levels of relevance and making it something that kids can relate to and then high levels of rigor, the test takes care of itself. Yeah. Um, we just, when we drill test, test, test in kids' heads, I mean, that's not what life's about. <laughs> life's sure. about learning and being prepared for college careers and life beyond and being good citizens too. So sure. so I, we just have to make sure that what we're doing is, is not because of a test, but the test will take care of itself if we're teaching at the levels we need to. That's wonderful. Um, you know, it, it's, it's nothing any of us want to talk about, but school safety is a big issue. Uh, yeah. Just since you've become the superintendent, there's been some high profile incidents across the country, uh, one of which even happened in Santa Fe, Texas, here, yes. in, here in our own state. Uh, what are some of the things LISD is doing to be prepared for situations and scenarios like that? Well, thank you for, a for asking that question because sure. it's really important. It's definitely top of our list. So I came on board February 1st and I thought, okay, I know we need to look at our safety plans. I knew what they were having been in the district, but you know, it's always good to refresh in light of, you know, new information, but I knew we needed to look at that and I thought, okay, summer project. We'll work on that this summer after the kids are out of school. And then February 14th was the Parkland, Florida shooting and I thought, no, we can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> so we immediately had community meetings and gathered community input. We shared what we already had in place, but got input on what parents and, and staff members um, wanted to see in place. We also had a student advisory, so we had representatives from all of our middle schools and high schools come in and give us feedback. And so we also had a safety audit done. In the last two weeks of school, we had an outside organization come in and audit every single one of our facilities. And so we knew what we needed to do from a facility standpoint to help um, increase safety. We partnered with I Love You Guys, which is a nonprofit foundation that has a lot of um, great tools, free tools. Um, we did have to pay for some training, but other than that, all of their resources are free. Um, and it's an organization based in Colorado. Um, the parents of a, a shooting victim in Colorado started this. And so they came out and did some training with um, our campus emergency management leaders, which is a new term, but sure. we have an emergency management team now on every campus. And so we have a standard response protocol that we've put in place so that we all have common language about around how do we respond. So we're really excited to have that in place. And, and we all have, as adults, we all have badges. And so we'll actually have that protocol on our badges so that you know in an emergency, you can look quickly and, and remember exactly what to do. Um, we also have developed a, sta a standard reunification plan, so if we do have to evacuate a building for any reason, we know how to get kids back with their families quickly and safely and in an organized way. Um, so those things are in place. We also um, are locking all classroom doors from the inside, which I know can be disruptive. Um, being an elementary principal, I know kids are constantly going in and out of the room to go to the nurse or our restroom or whatever, but um, we know that that is the number one Thing we can do if there is some sort of threat in a building is get kids behind a locked door. Mm -hmm. So, so we're putting that into place starting this year. Um, we also, because of the facility audit, know there's some things we need to put in place 
yeah. in the near future related to facilities as well. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that was sort of thrown out there was was arming teachers as a parent, a teacher, an administrator. What, where do you come down on that? What, do you, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> that is probably one of the most controversial topics in the school world right now is, is to arm or not to arm teachers. And 99.9% and .9 of teachers would not want to carry a gun. And so that's not the way most teachers are wired. That's not really um, their training or expertise. So our board of trustees has not made a decision on that at okay. this point in time. Um, I mean, we'll consider all options sure. with regard to keeping our kids safe, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're doing things that make sense and that are, are going to be in the best interest of our students and our teachers. Absolutely. Teachers need to feel safe as well, yeah. um, and they already have a big enough job, uh, <laughs> let alone taking on something We are like increasing that. police presence on our campuses. Um, we'll have one dedicated to every single high school who will stay there all of the time, um, and then we have, we have officers who will be on all campuses and we're working very closely with Lubbock Police Department as well so they're they're going to be on our campuses more than they have in the past so we're excited about that. Excellent. Uh, you know I think over the history of Lubbock and, and you said lifelong you've been here lifelong um, you know the east side has had some disparities economically mm -hmm. um, transportation commerce there's been a lot of disparity between the rest of Lubbock and, and then the east side and the north side communities um, on the east side Dunbar's doing great you look at the data Dunbar's doing great some of the other schools are, are struggling a little bit. How do you see, what's your philosophy on, on making sure that all schools feel equal, that the community as a whole feels like the superintendent and the administration cares about all schools equally and is doing everything to sort of build those schools up that are struggling? Well, we know equity does not mean equal. We have to put more resources into schools um, that that's need great. more. I like that. I like that. Same. <laughs> so yeah, that's so good. I would agree with you. Some of our East Lubbock schools and North Lubbock schools have struggled mm -hmm. more in the past than others. But I'm very excited to say that we don't have official data yet um, from the last round of tests. And I know tests are not what this is all about. Sure. But, um, unfortunately, it's in the state of Texas, it's, that's how, well, how we're it's how you measure. Right Absolutely. Yeah. But our our schools in East Lubbock have shown great progress. So in the near future, we're, you're going to see some celebrations. Excellent. And we're really excited about that. And, and we have put more resources into the schools that need that the most. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Uh, another, another issue that I've seen just as, as a citizen and talking to other families and things like that, there's, there's, there's a lot of people who want to transfer into friendship in Cooper and, and there's some attraction there. What, what, are, what are your philosophies or what's your take on um, making sure that Lubbock ISD re remains a, um, a choice for, for people, keeping people in the district, in our schools, um, and making sure that it's seen as an attractive location uh, just as much as maybe some of those surrounding districts. Well, and, and that's a great question. Um, we are only as strong as a community as all of our school districts in this community working together. And, and Mr. Bryant at Lubbock Cooper and Dr. McCord and Friendship and I are great friends that's and good. talk regularly. Um, that being said, we, we actually gain more students transferring into Lubbock ISD than we lose to those districts. Great. So that's important to know. Sure. Um, and part of that is because, because of our size, us being much, much larger, um, we are able to offer some things that they're not able to offer being smaller school districts. So for an example, our um, ATC, our Advanced Technology Center, and our, our Career Technology Education Programming is far and above anything around us. So students have options to um, follow coursework that will actually, they can graduate with a certification and be ready to go work in an industry right out of high school or go on to college and continue um, in a different, you know, in that career path that they choose. And so just economies of scale, we're able to offer more. Swimming and diving is another example. We're the only school district in this area that offers swimming and diving programming and orchestra is not offered everywhere so just just because we're larger we can offer more and give more choices to families absolutely you know in the wake of of um the santa fe shooting greg abbott praised lubbock uh, isd specifically um, for the mental health screening and preparedness protocols what are those because he didn't go into detail but <laughs> everyone made note of like oh the governor's talking about yeah. you know the lubbock school <laughs> district what are those protocols that he's talking about well it's interesting that you asked that because um 
he was talking about a program through Texas Tech Health Sciences Center called Twitter, okay. which is a telemedicine um, program that gives you access to immediate psychiatric evaluations. And it was designed for rural districts that do not have licensed school psychologists on staff or um, highly trained counselors on staff. And so um, Lubbock ISD was involved in that early on, but we had not been in more recent years. Okay. But, but they are actually designing a program around Lubbock now that um, we're going to be kind of their urban test site for that so that they can see how to work with larger districts and be able to provide support. So, so when we dug into it, we found out, okay, what <laughs> is he talking about? <laughs> what is he talking about? <laughs> but we later figured out what that was. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, another, another big topic that's come up in the world of education is teacher pay. Mm -hmm. You've been a teacher, you've been on the end of that. Like I said, my family has a, a deep background in teaching and it's, it's not enough, frankly. Uh, Lubbock ISD pays more than a lot of the surrounding districts, which, which is fantastic. But what's your philosophy on, on teacher pay and paying them like professionals? And, and how, how, do we, how do we bring a little, I mean, it's kind of been politicized, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, how do we bring more recognition to what teachers do every day and that they need to be paid more? How does, what are your philosophy on that and how do we make that happen? Well, I wish we could pay more because honestly, we can't pay them enough for mm -hmm. what they do yes. and, and the crucial role they play. Um, unfortunately, without more funding from the state, it's harder to do that because payroll is our most expensive, um, that's what we spend the majority of our funding on is, is salaries and so um, we can continue to look for ways to be more efficient in other areas so that we can continue to raise that pay. Um, I We're very fortunate in Lubbock that we can pay a little more and that helps us to attract and retain teachers. One of the things that our board is very committed to is something that we put in place several years ago but um, we actually use a tool to gain a teacher effectiveness score and we're actually able to pay teachers a bonus if they're showing effectiveness with students okay. and so that's been something that um, and in our highest need schools we actually have quadrupled that bonus so an example would be um, at Dunbar, some teachers actually walked away with a $15,000 bonus last year because of that effectiveness that they mm -hmm. had with students. So that's one way we've been able to do, to reward some teachers who are absolutely making progress with kids. That's wonderful. Uh, in, since February, what are some, you know, I, talking about all these kind of heavy topics, what are some success stories you've seen, either on the student side, teachers, parents, wherever it comes from, where are some successes you've seen in the district that excite you, that sort of point the way of what you'd like to see happen more often? Well, our predictive analytics of what our, our um, scores are going to be when they do come in, we're going to have a lot to celebrate. So we've, we've had some campuses that have come out of some pretty low spots that um, we've seen some great success with kids. So that's one big area. Yeah. Um, we have seen huge progress. I'm an elementary person by background, I'm elementary principal, elementary teacher, and the board really um, hired an elementary person on purpose because they really believe that if we get them on track when they're little, it's much easier to keep them on track as they move through school. So we've seen a lot of progress in our pre-K, K, first and second grade programming and that our reading levels of students is much higher than it has been in the past. So we're really excited about that. What are some, uh, some policy, you know, we're kind of talking philosophically. Uh -huh. What are the nuts and bolts? What are some policies you'd like to see implement or what are some things you'd like to really see get done uh, that can benefit the district? Well, um, one of the things we'll probably be doing um, later on this month is asking our voters to support some facility changes. Okay. Um, and part of the biggest part of that is around safety and security. Okay. Um, doing some things to our facilities to make them more safe for students. But one of the things we're also looking at, you know, we're in West Texas and agriculture is a huge part of our economy. Um, our agriculture programming that we offer students in our CTE coursework has not really changed a whole lot since I was in school. <laughs> and so we really need, we want to take that to the next level. And so that's one of the things we're looking at is, is um, some possible facilities and partnerships um, private partnerships to help us prepare students for 
jobs in agriculture science. And, and how, do you get, how do you get that message through to the community in a way that sort of resonates? I mean, I'll be honest, as I have three kids in the mm -hmm. district and I get texts, emails, phone calls, and at some point it kind of, kind of becomes noise. Um, is, is there a better way? And, and Nancy Sharp does an amazing she job. Does. She's incredible. Um, we've worked with her on other projects and different things. She's great. What are some of the ways you see getting that narrative out, sharing this information with the community in a way that they understand and then respond to rather than just sort of, I mean, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm like, ah, Coronado's <laughs> calling me again. You know, I know each yeah. school probably has its own uh, control of those types of things, but what are ways to get these messages across? I think for the most part, it's grassroots. I mean, yeah. it's bringing in stakeholder advisory groups. We met today with um, our ag advisory group, which are business people in the ag industry and and our ag teachers that are currently in place and Texas Tech was involved in that meeting as well. Um, we will be meeting with lots and lots of people <laughs> over the next few months as we um, move forward with that. But grassroots, I think social media, you know, is a great way to get the word out. Shows like yours is a great <laughs> way to get the word out. So really it's grassroots. Yeah. It's, it's boots on the ground and, and having ambassadors in your district that can go out and help spread the word. Sure. And, and one thing that, uh, that I find absolutely fascinating, and I'll probably talk 30 minutes about just this, <laughs> and I'm sure you do too, talking about social media. It can be very beneficial in certain ways, but also very distracting <laughs> to students. Phones and all those types of things. Yes. How in this day and age, with all of that, do teachers, uh, how, how do you handle that in today's <laughs> classroom? Because I, it just fascinates me to know in because we didn't have those distractions. No. And so I was distracted enough <laughs> and I didn't even have a phone. So how do you, how do you cut through that with students, make sure they're paying attention um, and sort of keep those new tools and everything else that they have at their disposal. And, and, and there's a lot of benefits to them too. Yeah. You can utilize those in a positive way. What is sort of your philosophy on social media in the classroom and phones in the classroom, those types of things? Well, um, we actually have Chromebooks now and pretty much a one-to-one -one yeah. <laughs> um, where students have access to a Chromebook in every class. Um, so a lot of active monitoring has to take place so that we know kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing while they're um, using those tools, but we really have found that um, the teachers who really embrace that, the kids are more engaged and they stay on task and focused. Um, you're right about social media. I don't know that we use social media as much as we use a lot of the Google tools mm -hmm. um, for instruction, and that has been phenomenal. Um, but yeah, social media can be a distraction, and, and um, we definitely spend a lot of time in schools handling issues that arise. I mean, it's a daily thing with social yeah. media, but <laughs> we all, it also helps us keep a good pulse on yeah. where we are, and, um, and we use it as a district sure. to help promote and tell our story Absolutely. all the time. Absolutely, and communication goes both ways. What are some ways that the community, students, parents, can get in touch with you or, or get messages to you or let you know their concerns and things that they see going on that they want to address? Well, we I have a link on our website that goes directly to me, an email that goes directly to me, so that's absolutely one way. Um, through Nancy Sharp is also a great way. Um, and then as far as, as parents, I'm trying to do a lot of outreach as well. Um, we're about to film a, a video to talk about safety before yes. the kids come back next week. So we'll send that out in a link to parents as well. We have a school um, tool that we use that we can send, well, you know, because you get the calls <laughs> as a parent, but um, we're gonna try to take uh, more advantage of that as well as use more videos to help communicate as well. Absolutely, what, what's, a, what's, a, what's a big challenge you see that you'd like to, at the end of, uh, of, of your turn, at the end of, do, of being the superintendent, you go, I'm so glad we saw that challenge and took care of it. Uh, well, a couple of things that we've actually already set in motion. Um, one of the things we did not have in place is a systematic um, across the district phonics program for K-1-2. And so we've got that ready to go day one. So I'm, I've already mentioned we've seen progress in reading levels, but I expect to see that even expand more. Yeah. And then I've already mentioned the Ag STEM programming. Yeah. I think that's going to be something really cool that we continue to do. Um, and then just, in, we want this to be, a, a continue to be a school district of choice. And so we're only as strong as our weakest school. 
I want to see every school thriving. And so we're not quite there yet, but we will be. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time for being here today. Oh, thank it you. went by fast, it right? Did. It kind of soars by. It thank you sure so much did. for coming on. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much for watching the sit down. For other episodes, go to KTTZ.org. Thank you. Thanks. Wow, thank you. <laughs> that